You're listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. First off, what is Kabbalah? Answer. Uh, Kabbalah is the ancient Jewish tradition of mystical interpretation of the Bible. First transmitted orally and using esoteric methods, uh, specifically the Old Testament. Uh, Kabbalah is an esoteric method, discipline, and school of thought that originated with Judaism. Okay. Uh, what is the actual connection of Kabbalah to Judaism? Answer. Uh, it is not possible to discuss Kabbalah apart from a conversation on what is called Judaism or simply Jewish doctrine. Uh, some Christians think that Judaism is simply a study of the Old Testament. That is called ignorance, which is why many believers are confused as to why followers of Judaism can so firmly deny Yeshua as their Messiah. A Jewish doctrine regarding the Old Testament comes primarily from two sources. One is the Babylonian Talmud, which is a commentary on the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the first major written collection of Jewish oral traditions known as Oral Torah. Right. And, and, and so for a thousand years plus, th these uh, rabbis were passing down the oral tradition from one generation to the next. And around 200 AD, after, you know, everyone was dispersed, you know, the Roman tyranny against Jews and all this stuff, they decided to write it all down. And uh, that oral Torah became the Mishnah. And then the Babylonian Talmud is the commentary where they're explaining all of their oral traditions. So th this is the first major work of rabbinic literature when it comes to Jewish doctrine. This oral Torah is considered by Orthodox Jews to be as divinely inspired as the Old Testament itself. As a matter of fact, some of them say the oral Torah, which is, you know, the Mishnah, comes from a revelation that God gave to the 70 uh, elders that did not go up Mount Sinai with Moses. And they say that God gave the 70 a superior revelation to Moses. I mean, I mean so it's really interesting where they kind of rank some of this stuff. So the Babylonian Talmud is known as the Sea of Talmud. They get a lot of their doctrine from this guy, right? And this is the same thing, that oral Torah is what Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees for. So they put on the level of scripture what we know is a rebuked by Jesus. That's part of their doctrine. It's called the leaven of the Pharisees. And then they add to that Kabbalah, which in itself means to receive. It is a collection of the Jewish esoteric books. Even the most conservative Jewish rabbis today acknowledge that Orthodox Jews give credence to the Kabbalistic works, whose primary texts include the Zohar, also known as the Book of Splendor, Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Mysteries, the Gate of Reincarnations. Yes, uh, Kabbalists believe in reincarnation. Uh, three Enoch, which is not to be confused with one Enoch. And we talked about this last week somewhat as we were exploring Metatron. And three Enoch is all about a rabbi who lived after the death of Jesus, who ascends into the spirit world and has this encounter with an angel that's called Metatron, who turns out to be Enoch. And so this book becomes three Enoch, and we learn all about Metatron. So uh, we, we talked about all of that last week. Why are we talking about Kabbalah, answer, we're investigating it because Kabbalah is not of God, okay? Um, using Kabbalah to better understand the Old Testament is like using the Book of Mormon to better understand the New Testament. What begins as an investigation to extra-biblical text lands you in a different religion. K Kabbalah is not Christianity. Kabbalah is not going to get you closer to Jesus. I don't care who's teaching that Kabbalah is, you know, some kind of Hebrew or Jewish. What it, it, it's, it is a revelation of the government of Lucifer is what it is. Um, it has influenced major areas of Christendom. And since many believers do not know what Kabbalah is, they neither know what its beliefs are, know how to identify where its influence has poisoned the waters in the body of Christ. Kabbalah teaches an esoteric template for man and the creation known as the Kabbalah tree. It is a source of revelation for students of the deep occult and... It is also a programming template for survivors of satanic ritual abuse. And um, many your famous students of Kabbalah include people like Eliphas Levi, who led the occult revival of the 1800s, McGregor Mathers, 
one of three founders of the Order of the Golden Dawn. He was also someone who translated a number of the books of Zohar, <laughs> right? So these Jewish rabbis are reading books translated into English by McGregor Mathers, one of the three founders of the Order of the Golden Dawn. So you can see how some of these uh, tangled webs weave, right? He also translated a book called the uh, Key of Solomon, which we'll get to next week when we start talking about Tetragrammaton. This guy mentored Aleister Crowley, H.P. Blavatsky. Uh, she uh, was uh, one of the um, founders of the Theosophical Society. Um, she believed the Jews through books like the Kabbalah had stolen books of black magic that previously came from the Chaldeans. She, she actually thought the Jews were squatters on occult knowledge that belonged to other groups. And that's how she viewed just how powerful their stuff is. <laughs> Right. Um, the Theosophical Society is the same group that Alice Bailey, which some of you may recognize, um, associated with. She is the first person that deployed the term New Age. Um, she talked about the coming age of Aquarius. She established Lucifer Trust. She is associated with Kabbalistic ideologies. A.E. Waite. He is uh, author of several significant adult texts on subjects of Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, ceremonial magic, and of course, Kabbalism. Manly P. Hall, uh, famous Freemason, author of Secret Magic of Kabbalah, Albert Pike. And we're actually going to get into Albert Pike a little bit today. Another famous high-ranking Freemason from the 1800s, author of Morals and Dogma. This is um, a real, real uh, raunchy group of people. And, you know, if you want to know the root, look at the fruit, right? So why do we need to avoid Kabbalah? Titus 1, 10 through 14 says, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and the commandments of men who turn from the truth. Jewish fables would include oral Torah, Mishnah, Babylonian Talmud, and of course, Kabbalah, which, as we have been talking about all this time, uh, literally has a cosmology designed to write Jesus out of the entire equation. Um the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you a, as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he who comes preaches Another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may put up with it. In other words, if I come to you and say, hey, why don't we ascend into Metatron's cube? You might say yes. If I say, hey, why don't we look at this Metatron guy? Because he's actually a reveal of Yeshua. You might say, yeah, even though that's pure Kabbalah and Metatron is the equivalent of our biblical man of sin and son of perdition, as we looked at last week. So, you know, um, people get deceived all the time. I'm not trying to put shame on those of you that have been deceived by this nonsense, but uh, we're trying to straighten the whole thing out. You know, Paul was concerned. There's some really bad teaching going around. And I, I am concerned as well, which is one of the reasons why we're doing this whole series, because I'm realizing, like, our platform was getting associated with Kabbalah being taught as an addendum to Christianity by certain individuals. And I'm like, no, no, not associated with that. I'm getting people out of the tree. And some people are in groups that are putting them in the tree. <laughs> so, 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 so we're drawing a line. And I'm explaining why the line has to be drawn. Now, why, what have we learned about Kabbalah? What have we learned about Kabbalah? So the Zohar goes into great detail on the 10 Sephirot. <sighs> and uh, we're going to go to our handy dandy slides, right? The, the, the Kabbalah goes into great detail on the 10 Sephirot. And the creation story they reveal, okay? So we've talked about this several times. Um, you have up here Ein Sof. And uh, I can just pull us into this picture back here where you can actually see it. 
Um, you have Ein, Ein Sof, Ein Sofire. This is their like God, uh, the limitless light from nothing who forms uh, a void within himself in the creation in order to establish the creation and then sends this light in and it goes into these different um, containers or vessels. Keter, Chokma, Bina, Chesed, Givora, Tefret, Netzach, Had, Yesed, and then finally down to Melkut. You have this lightning bolt of light that this Ein Sof uses in order to establish the creation. Everything above here is in the spirit. Down here, this is physical. This is all review. You can go back to some of our former lessons in order to get this broken down. Um, the Kabbalah tree is referred to as a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil interchangeably. It functions as a creative myth, a counterfeit creative template. Does that explain the, the nature of creation? and a template for the design of man. Last, um, in, a, in a former session, we also learned that uh, this Jewish myth begins by replacing the revelation that Elohim is the creator. In other words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth with the Kabbalah version of that, which says um, in the beginning, in unmentioned, Ein Sof works with Keter and Chokma to create God or Elohim, in other words, that Keter and Chokma work with Ein Sof to create Elohim. And so by doing this, you actually take Jesus out of the entire creation because in John 1 1, we don't learn that Ein Sof worked with Keter and Chokma to create Elohim and then the rest of the creation. We learn that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, they write Jesus out of the narrative. So we talked at length about that and we established on this point alone that Kabbalah narrative is irreconcilable with Christianity to the core. With this foundation, we taught through the rest of the tree how, you know, th these 10 sephirot tell a story of light traveling downward through the creation to Malkut, which becomes the kingdom or the physical world. The kingdom is also known as Shekinah, which in their cosmology is the female counterpart of Ein Sof, and also the gateway to man's ascension to knowledge, the bride of Typhret and the mother who is one with the children of Israel. So they have a different definition of uh, Shekinah when you hear a Jew or, or someone that follows this Jewish mysticism use that language. It doesn't mean just like, simple glory. It, it has a very, very specific meaning. Um, and the whole idea is that the vessels have been shattered. And so one can work their way up the tree into greater and greater illumination. And ultimately, uh, we talked about how there's this agenda to establish Tikkun, which is a repair of the worlds. Okay. Um, a lot of concepts if you didn't hear me teach it in the former weeks, you're going to have to go back because I can't go back. Um, last week, we learned about Messiah ben Joseph and that he is also called Metatron, the angel of the presence. Now, uh, here again, we find another usurpation of Jesus who was Messiah and whose earthly father figure was named Joseph, literally. <laughs> Actually, people knew him as Jesus, son of Joseph, but they say, no, 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 no. Our Messiah ben Joseph has not come yet, and he is of the same soul as Joseph, the son of Jacob. And he is Metatron, who is Enoch, and he's coming to establish the third temple and sit there and reinstate the sacrifice, right? So their Messiah ben Joseph uh, becomes the same character as our man of sin and son of perdition, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Go figure, right? So again, we see this dismissal of the actual office of Jesus Christ in order to put their Antichrist agenda in play. The, the entire system of Kabbalah is a system of Antichrist religion that is against the revelation of Jesus Christ. It holds those that are in Judaism captive to the Antichrist spirit. It's the belief system, right? So we Again, dismiss Jesus from the creation. We find another spirit called Metatron who gets credited with being the divine spirit in their mind, who was with Israel in the wilderness, who is the driver of political Zionism and who is bringing about this redemption of the, uh, uh, of the international influence of the, uh, you know, the 
the glory of Israel. And um, we, we learned some of that from Kol Hator, which is a book of Kabbalistic eschatology. And we talked about that last week. And that catches us up to where we are this week, <laughs> where we're going to explore Jewishness as it relates to the greater plan of political Zionism, which is absolutely tied to Kabbalah. <laughs> okay. Now, I have a lot to say today. And we're going to start with this question. What does it mean to be a Jew? What does it mean to be a Jew? So here's a brief review of history. Okay. God made a promise to Abraham. He said, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Abraham had a son named Isaac who had a son named Jacob. These are patriarchs. Then in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, the Bible says, And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So, what do we learn there? We learn that Israel begins as a man, Jacob. Now, Jacob, as many of you know, had 12 sons, right? So I'm going to slow walk us through the history so that when I begin to make my points, it all makes sense, right? I'm, I'm not going to skip any steps and make this any more confusing than it already is. Um, so the sons of Jacob are defined in Genesis 35 uh, verses 20 through to 26. So the Bible says, now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. So we have what are known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Now Joseph goes on to have two sons who are Ephraim and Manasseh. And they are considered half-tribes. Uh, at, at his death, Israel, or Jacob, uh, prophesies over each of them, Ephraim and Manasseh, independently. So we have 12 tribes, but the tribe of Joseph is divided into two half-tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, the children of Israel were in captivity to Egypt for many years until God raised up Moses as their deliverer. In Egypt, they multiplied and became a mighty nation, right? How, how many of you are following so far? This all makes sense. So, so right now, we don't have any Jews. There's no such thing as a Jew. What's a Jew? We have the Israelites and the children of Israel. There's no Jews. So Moses is raised up by God and leads the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness. Now, Joshua then leads them out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And after Joshua dies, the 12 tribes dwell in their respective areas of the promised land and spend hundreds of years going in and out of bondage because they're marrying the Canaanite women. They're mingling with their gods. And then God says, oh, well, According to the contract, when you do that, I'm going to turn you over to your enemies. You will be cursed and not blessed. Your stuff won't work. You'll be overtaken by your enemies. And, you know, God's a man of his word. And so, because they were under that old covenant and it came with a curse, they would operate under the curse. And so they'd go in and out of bondage. And then when it cry out in repentance, God would raise up a judge to deliver them. Hence the entire book of Judges. So eventually... Israel begins to cry out for a king. They're like, all right, we don't want any judges anymore. We don't want God to be king over us. 
We want an earthly king like all of our pagan neighbors. So God talks to Samuel and has him appoint Saul, a Benjamite, as king. Now, Saul unites the tribes of Israel and defeats several of their enemies. However, he's not very obedient. And his disobedience causes God to take his spirit from Saul. And uh, God has Samuel appoint another king, and everyone knows that's King David. So Saul eventually dies in battle, right? And, and, and this is years after David gets appointed king. And, 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 and during that time, you know, first David is like Saul's number one guy. Then Saul gets jealous and he tries to kill David. And David has to flee for his life and wander around and meets his mighty men and trains them up. and All this stuff happens, okay? Now, Saul dies finally in battle. And then um, his heir, Ishbael, rules over the northern tribes while David is made king over Judah. And David later succeeds in uniting the kingdoms and then passes the kingdom to Solomon. So, so you have this division beginning at that time where Judah actually received David before the rest of the tribes of Israel did. Now, we still don't have any Jews, but we do have this idea that, okay, the, the, the kingdoms are separate. We're not fully in line here. You know, the tribes aren't um, always in agreement. Now, uh, David passes the kingdom to Solomon, and that brings Israel into the golden age, right? During the kingdom of Solomon, the, the, the servants were eating on silver platters. Everyone's rich, happy, and then, you know, Solomon deteriorates, and eventually he dies. And when he dies, Israel is again divided. Okay, now this is what produces a northern kingdom, which becomes known as Israel, and a southern kingdom, which includes the tribe of Judah, the Levites, and a portion of the tribe of Benjamin. So you have this split. And when that southern kingdom begins to become known as Judah, we begin to refer to the people of the lower kingdom as Jews. And from that point in Israel's history, what we see is that there is actually like a faster deterioration of morality in the northern kingdom than the southern kingdom, although the southern kingdom has its fair share of evil kings. So finally, things get so bad that God serves Israel a bill of divorce. And he references that in Jeremiah 3.8. Bible says, then I saw um, that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. All right. So by the year 722, Assyria succeeds in completely taking out the kingdom of Israel, right? Uh, they, they, they just crush them in battle, and the, the diaspora of the northern kingdom begins. Um, Babylon hasn't even arrived under Nebuchadnezzar by this point. This is the kingdom of Assyria. And so the southern kingdom continues. They actually are, are, are ultimately delivered from total, you know, wipeout at that time. But a large number of the tribes, they, they, they wind up in, in captivity and ultimately they go out into the nations never to be heard from again. So the Northern tribes never return to the land in any formal way and are truly dispersed among the nations. Now we see the Southern kingdom continue on for a while. And, and, and uh, this is where you actually do have, Jews. As a matter of fact, the word Jew is first used in the Bible in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 25. That's the first time in the whole Bible where we see the word Jew. Okay. And and and, and so the history of, of Judah uh really takes a turn for the worse in about 600 BC when Nebuchadnezzar invades Judah. 
and places a tribute on those that are left there while taking a whole bunch of people into captivity, including Daniel the prophet. This begins a period in their history known as the 70 year captivity. And after 70 years, those of the Southern kingdom are legally restored and permitted to rebuild the temple under King Cyrus. But what happens, unfortunately, is that there's no follow through. So you have Daniel bringing this issue up to King uh, Cyrus because he knew by the books that the 70 years were up. And he writes about this in the book of Daniel. But even though the decree goes forth, it's like, all right, well, we're going to restore Israel. Nothing really happens until we hit the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, where Artaxerxes, another king, reaffirms the decree of Cyrus. Okay. And so it's at that time around 445 BC or so, where we actually see, okay, we're going to start to rebuild this temple and restore things. And, um, you know, that, that's the whole book of Nehemiah, where Nehemiah is like dealing with the debt that some of the people had left the, uh, ch the children of Judah with and all this other stuff. And they're building the wall and, you know, hammer in one hand and a sword in the other, this whole story, right? So anyway, um, as we move forward, you know, they get their temple roughly rebuilt, but, but from one kingdom to the next, Israel is never restored as its own independent nation. They, they continue to be almost like a province of the world powers. And we move from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece, and then ultimately to Rome. And so it, Rome is in charge by the time that Jesus is born. And as we read the New Testament, we, we learn that, um, well, the Jews are a subpopulation of Israel, okay? The term Israelite is a term that applies to all of the tribes of Israel, most of which haven't been heard from for 700 years by the time that Jesus is being born. The Jews are a subpopulation of Israel, and for all intents and purposes, um, you know, they basically include Judah, the Levites, and some of the tribe of Benjamin. And this is the people group that Jesus localizes his ministry to. He, he, he ministers around the area of, of Galilee and, um, you know, th th this, this whole little sliver there. Um, making the Jews his primary mission field. And even on uh, uh, one occasion where he is invited to go off into Samaria and a, and a woman asking him to help his daughter, you know, he, he just gives the word and the daughter is healed, but he doesn't actually travel there, right? So the Jews are living in a province of the Roman kingdom at this time, which is called Israel, okay? But it's a province. It's not the nation that is independent and its own government and its own laws and all of that. I mean, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees, you know, they, they're running from the temple and they do have their laws through the religion, but they are underneath the jurisdiction of Rome, which is why you have them answering to Pontius Pilate and all this other stuff, right? So, so, so at the time that Jesus is alive, you have a bunch of Jews and they are living in a province called Israel, but this is not the Israel of 800 years ago because the tribes that represent Israel aren't there. All right. So now that I've said all that, we see this clearly depicted in um, an early passage in the Gospels. It says, arise, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he, being Joseph, arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. So, so Herod dies, and, and, and before he died, he killed all these infants. So Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, they travel to Egypt. And then once Herod dies, Joseph is told, hey, you can go back now. And, but instead of going back to the area of Judea, they go over to Galilee. And they kind of set up shop there, right? But the whole region is called Israel. 
<laughs> so we're defining our terms. So there's less confusion here. What, what are we talking about, right? Now, when we get to the book of Romans, this is what we learn in Romans 1.16. Okay, follow this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So the Bible does say that Paul believed that the power of God to salvation was for the Jew first, right? And so, yeah. This is where the confusion begins, right? Because now in the body of Christ, we're really confused about where Jews fall in the overarching redemptive plan of God. Are Jews more important than Gentiles when it comes to people being saved? Why do Christians get so excited when they find out that, you know, Ancestry.com says they have some Jewishness in their blood? For, furthermore, how do we define Jewishness at all? Now, now <laughs> I'm going to mess you all up real bad by beginning with how the Bible defines Jews, okay? That's where we're going to start, and then we're going to move into real confusion. <laughs> and we're going to sort it all out, and at the end, we're all going to be on the same page, right? Um, in Romans chapter 11, we find more conversation about Israel, Okay? As a matter of fact, what we learn is that Jesus Christ becomes Israel and the Redeemer of Israel and um, the people of God that he foreknows are being addressed in order for the reader to understand that God's redemptive agenda through Jesus is to bring the children of Israel, of which Paul, who calls himself of the tribe of Benjamin, is a member. He's like, Jesus died for you. And so we go further in Romans 11, and Jesus defines himself as the cultivated olive tree. Through his redemptive work, in that he establishes a new covenant, unbelieving Jews are broken off and believing Gentiles are grafted into him. And then if the unbelieving Jews turn to Jesus, they are grafted in again. All right. Now let's look at the Bible. Romans chapter 11, verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. We learned that Jesus is the root of Jesse. So verse 17 says, and if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, jump over to verse 19, you will say then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Jump over to verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. In other words, if Jews don't believe in Yeshua as their Messiah, God has nothing for them. Jesus is their Messiah as much as Jesus is the Messiah of the Gentiles. They need him just as much as we need him. <laughs> And guess what? If you find you have Jewishness in your blood, you still need him. I'm here to preach Jesus. Christ crucified in the finished work accomplished by the shedding of his blood. And it doesn't matter if I'm talking to a Jew or a Gentile. That's what Romans 11 is saying, right? But some people, they, they, they begin to read this and they're like, oh no, there's something different going on for the Jews. Where does it say that? It's all about them getting grafted in again because right now they're out. They are not in. They are out. They are outside of the new covenant by which men must be saved. There is only one name under heaven by which men must be saved. Some Christians teach that Jews have their own special covenant. That the church is a parenthesis in God's overarching redemptive work involving this genetic nation. Where do they get that? They didn't get it from Romans 11, I promise you. 
Jews need Yeshua, Jesus. Gentiles need Yeshua, Jesus. End of conversation. Can we move on? Now, now here, we, we, we're going to be setting the record straight. Okay? Um, Jesus is the cultivated olive tree. Gentiles go into him. Jews go into him. And we become partakers of the commonwealth of Israel. But Jesus is the source. Now, this is the right understanding because Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Jeremiah 31. Now, the dispensationalists teach this completely different than what I'm about to tell you because they get their doctrine from Zionism. But I'll get to that later. Here's what you need to know. Jesus stands as a representative of both the house of Israel and the house of Judah in Jeremiah 31, fulfilling these prophecies in his own person. Okay, follow me now. And for those of you that have taken my classes, this is going to really like, oh, you're like, oh, I know this because I put this in my classes. It, 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 it's because it, people get so confused. Jeremiah 31 says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them and on their hearts will I write it. I will be their God and they will be my people, right? So now we have a bunch of Christian Zionists looking forward to the coming kingdom where God makes a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. How backwards is that? So let me show you why that's backwards. Hosea 11, chapter one, follow me. Hosea chapter 11, one. The Bible says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Hosea 11, one is fulfilled in Matthew chapter two, verse 15. And why people miss this, I don't understand. So I'm sitting here because someone's got to say it. The Bible says in Matthew 2, 15, and was there, this is in Egypt, until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, of the Lord, by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. In other words, God, through Jeremiah, right, says that um, he is going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And in Hosea 11.1, he says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And then in Matthew 2, 15, we have the Bible interpret itself for us. And God is saying, look, Jesus is my son, the one who I called out of Egypt. Whoa, this means that Jesus fulfills Israel in himself. He actually takes the office of Israel by what he fulfills prophetically in the scriptures. So he, in his person, is able to establish a covenant with the Father on behalf of Israel, which is God's Israel, the 12 tribes that no one's heard of for 800 years. Oh my gosh, but we're not done yet because Jesus finishes fulfilling Jeremiah 31 all by himself in Revelation 5.5 5 because it says, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. In other words, David, the root of David is Jesus. And so he becomes a proxy for Judah. And so when God, the father, makes a new covenant between him and the son, it becomes an unbreakable covenant. There's nothing you can do that can undo the finished work of Jesus Christ absolutely nothing. You are either in this covenant or you are out of the covenant, but you cannot break a covenant that you are not responsible for. Jesus in his own person is fully responsible to uphold every requirement righteously of this covenant. Thus he fulfills the law and thus he establishes a reuniting between man and God in his own person, fulfilling Jeremiah 31. So what new covenant do the Jews need? They need Jesus. I'm not done yet. 
We're just getting started. I am really sick and tired of this nonsense that people, people are so confused. But a lot of it stems from Kabbalah. Now, moving on, right? Therefore, we learn that Israel in the New Testament is synonymous with the kingdom of God. The children of God in the New Testament through the finished work of Jesus Christ are redefined to be all Jew and Gentile that believe in Jesus, right? These are the children of God. As many as are believing, you know, as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And you are sons. And if sons and heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 13, watch this, watch this. Come on now, follow me. Don't get lost. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. In other words, Jesus is Israel. Jesus takes the Gentiles and puts them in Israel. Jesus takes the Jews and puts them in Israel. He is the root. Now we partake of the fatness of the tree and we are all made members of the commonwealth of Israel. So in the new covenant, Israel really is redefined according to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, some people get really mad. You're a replacement theologian, Dandival. First of all, first of all, everything that I have said has come straight from the clear reading of scripture. What I have realized is that this accusation of replacement theology has largely come from the dispensationalist camp. But the dispensationalists are programmed by an agenda that was brought in through the Schofield Bible that was funded by political Zionists and Kabbalists. Literally, the Illuminati printed that Bible and put it into our seminaries. All right. Wait, <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> now. We're driving, okay? There is a commonwealth of Israel. Jews are brought in. Gentiles are brought in. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29. Now, this is where I just, there's such a breakdown in logic. People just, their whole brain just melts. Blah, right? It says, for he is not a Jew. Not a Jew which is one who is outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. In other words, I don't care if you were born from the tribe of Judah, from the tribe of Levi, or one of those members from the tribe of Benjamin, <laughs> you're, you're, you're no longer a Jew in the eyes of God. Because God's definition of Jew is those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and have received a circumcision of their heart. Plain and simple. That's a, literally the plain text reading of the word. Now, some of you, your brain is like breaking. Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Like, it's like, I, I, uh. but don't argue with me. Argue with the word. I'm going to keep going. We have to drive this thing. Um, Galatians 3.28. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15. Let's just round this whole thing out. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. <laughs> Wait for it, right? Jew and Gentile, thus making peace. So Jesus reconciles Jew and Gentile in himself. Now we're all Israel. <laughs> now we're all Jews. So when I go and I get accused of being anti-Semitic, I now can say, 
quite literally, well, according to my definition of Jew, I'd have to be anti Dan Duvall because I am Jew. <laughs> That's God's definition. Okay, now, therefore, as a result of the finished work of Jesus Christ, we're left with new definitions. Israel is the kingdom of God. It is a commonwealth which, through Jesus Christ, is populated by all Jew and Gentile who believe in him. Jews are those who have been circumcised, not in the flesh, but in the heart, meaning that being Jewish in the eyes of Jesus has nothing to do with the genetics of one's parentage, but the condition of their heart before God and their conviction of Jesus as Messiah. Next point. This leaves us with two aspects to reconcile. One, in the New Testament, the Bible could not be any clearer about who the Jews and Israel are in the eyes of God. And they are not the genetic lineage, okay? But the Bible also couldn't be clear about God's redemptive agenda for Jew and Gentile, which is salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, there is one more piece of this puzzle that doesn't go away with all of this. And that comes in the book of Revelation, Chapter 4, 7, verses 4 through 8. And it says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Now, suddenly out of nowhere, we again are being told about some kind of agenda of God for the tribes. The tribes, quite literally, people we haven't heard about for 2,800 years. Where are they? The tribe of Asher, tribe of Benjamin, um, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, right? All of these guys, uh, conveniently, Dan is not part of this group. So Dan goes out, Manasseh comes in, and Manasseh and Joseph become two tribes in this particular categorization. Uh, don't ask me why Dan isn't there. I don't have that answer right now. But what I am saying is there is something. There is something that no one knows yet. No one fully knows what this agenda is for the tribes. But there is this agenda for the tribes that still does exist in the book of Revelation, which is why, you know, I, I come back and I'm like, oh, well, I'm not a full replacement theologian where I say, well, everything everywhere is now um, implicating directly the body of Christ. There's something going on, but it's not political Zionism. Now, moving on from here, we, we, we're, we're going to get into more nitty gritty, right? This is where we hit outright confusion. All right. So, now that we know what the Bible says about the issue, we have to come back to present day and how everything is getting twisted by Kabbalah-based political Zionism. Because we are somehow still being told to believe that the Jews are still the chosen people of God. Yet, wait a minute, the Christians are the Jews according to the Bible. So why do I now need to look at these different groups that are coming out of diaspora in the Middle East and calling them Jews? Oh, wait, that's right, because I'm in someone else's belief system. I'm in a different religion now. So now they have redefined words to mean what they want them to mean. The only problem is they put their definition in my Schofield Bible, which went into my seminary, <coughs> so that my uh, seminarian teacher would teach me their version of this story, and then I'd go out and teach you. See how that works? Because if you read the Bible, <laughs> God is very clear about who Israel and the Jews are right now. All right, now, anyway, we are told to believe that Jews are still the chosen people of God and that they have a separate covenant with Judah, Jehovah. And this largely drips in from dispensationalism. All right, now I'm going to go here. A type of biblical interpretive model that divides the Bible into a series of ages or dispensations defined by covenants. That's what dispensationalism is. Uh, many Christians were not aware that <clears throat> there are really two primary camps of interpretation of the Bible, and they are largely the dispensationalist camp 
and the covenant theology camp. <clears throat> uh, dispensationalists, you can oversimplify their version of the Bible interpretation by saying, um, replaced unless repeated. In other words, um, a lot of the Old Testament goes away and it becomes irrelevant, except for whatever happens to do with the Jews, because, well, the New Testament is what we have for the church, and the church is the parenthesis in God's overarching plan for the physical Jews. Okay. So, but a lot of what's there doesn't really apply to Christian teaching, because we're the parenthesis. So you, you have a replacement unless repeated. In covenant theology, it's a more integrative Bible interpretation model where you, you maintain unless it's modified. So you are actually interpreting the Old Testament through the lens of Christ a lot more often and a lot more intentionally. It's interesting, though, and I, I, I really could break this down if I had enough time, that Kabbalah has infiltrated both camps of interpretive models in different ways. On one side, we have the covenant, which leans more on the Hebrew roots infiltration, uh, getting people to go back to Torah based on um, receiving teaching from rabbis who are initiated Kabbalists, in some cases. And then on the dispensationalist side, we're, we're, we're teaching people a totally different view of the Bible, that the church is God's parenthesis and its overarching narrative for ancient Israel, and that we're going to get out of God's way with a pre-trib rapture, and then he's going to finish his plan. Right, both have elements of Kabbalistic doctrine that are messing people up inside of them. Now, let's explain this a little bit further, right? In its doctrine for the church, dispensationalism holds that the Jewish rejection of the kingdom caused Jesus to postpone the kingdom of God until the second advent. I need you to listen to that very carefully. Dispensationalism holds that the Jewish rejection of the kingdom of God caused Jesus to postpone bone the kingdom until the second advent. In other words, when Jesus comes back the second time, he's bringing the kingdom with him. How many people have heard that taught, right? And so because he's bringing the kingdom with him when he returns again, uh, he has established the church as an interlude between two advents. But Jesus says the exact opposite thing. It's so opposite. It's opposite. It literally is opposite. <laughs> the absolute different thing that that thing says. It couldn't be farther apart. <laughs> it is so different. <laughs> you, you cannot imagine what I go through when I put these notes together, guys. I mean, because I try to stay out of it, but when I get in a mess, I mean, I get in the mess. Like, argh, argh, argh. like I go, like those are my faces while I'm making my notes. Like, argh, argh. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Anyway, so 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 we're gonna go through a few verses here, and I'm gonna show you just how ridiculous, right? All this stuff is dispensationalists couldn't be farther off. The Bible says in Matthew 23, 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. In other words, first of all, the kingdom of God was already here, interfacing with earth. They weren't going in. So how can Jesus postpone something that's already here? So, so then we go to the next point, right? Um, Matthew 21, 43. Therefore, I say unto you, these are the words of Jesus. The kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. In other words, I am taking away something you already had. Wait, the dispensationalists are saying that he's postponing the kingdom until he comes back. Where did they get that from? Kabbalah, Kabbalah. They got it from the Jewish doctrine because the Jews are still waiting for their Messiah to restore the kingdom. <laughs> but our Messiah restored a kingdom that we know not of. This one. So we wrote all of our theology around their belief system. And then we preach it to people for a hundred years. Baptists, Pentecostals, <laughs> word of faith. We're still preaching pre-trib rapture in half of these places. And it makes me sick. I vomit in my mouth. I, I'm, I, this, this, this sucks. 
right? And, 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 and then I come out. Guys, the kingdom's already here. Oh, Daniel, I heard about that kingdom now preaching. That's a cult. I'm a cult. Your whole doctrine came from the occult. And your doctrine told you that you have a get out of jail free ticket and a preacher of rapture. That's not coming, I promise. And guess what? You're a powerless cessationist gospel. <laughs> That's the occult ensuring that you don't meddle with their plans with the finished work of Jesus Christ that should be alive and well in you. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> ah. So they impale the church with the cessation. The cessationism doctrine came right along with dispensationalism. It came in one package. Gifts of God ended with the first church. We are here to preach the gospel, warm a pew, and get out of here before Antichrist shows up. Jesus has to rescue us from the Antichrist. Are you kidding me? God has to rescue the Antichrist from me. <laughs> in Jesus' name, I'm going after this guy. I'm going after the Antichrist spirit in you, and you, and you, and you. <laughs> He's not going to get away. That Antichrist spirit is going to get his butt kicked if he's standing in front of me during a deliverance session. I promise you, I'm coming after Antichrist in the name of Jesus. And you should too. You're sitting here looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm looking at you like you're crazy. Do you know who you serve? Antichrist is the replacement for Jesus. He's the, <laughs> the counterfeit, the less than. We're so confused. So, 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 so then Jesus says, um, Peter says in the book of 1 Peter 2 9, you, you have to follow me. Listen. But you, the corporate church, spiritual Israel, you, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the nation that Jesus took the kingdom of God from or, or the nation that Jesus gave the kingdom of God to is a spiritual nation of Israel in him. And he took it from the genetic Jews. He said, you Pharisees, you scribes, you idiots. I'm going to take it from you and give it to another nation. That nation is the nation in him of which Jew and Gentile are grafted in. That's the one. So, so not only are dispensationalists wrong on the idea that Jesus is postponing the bringing in of his kingdom, they don't recognize that it's been here all this time. The kingdom of God has transferred to, through covenants, allowing different people access through different covenants. So the covenant that Israel had at Mount Sinai allowed them access to the kingdom of God as long as they obeyed the law. And God said, this is going to be the evidence, the demonstration of your engagement with my kingdom, my supernatural sphere. When you obey me, blessed will you be in the city. Blessed will you be in the country. Blessed will you be when you come in. Blessed will you be when you go out. You will be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Your breadbasket, all of Deuteronomy 28. That is the supernatural overlay of God's spirit kingdom superimposed on Israel's reality. The same kingdom that's supposed to superimpose our reality right now because we have it. But they had it, but they weren't going in and they were blocking everybody with their nonsense. <laughs> we could call it their Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is still keeping us out. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm going after dispensationalists. And you know what? If you are a dispensationalist, all you got to do is repent because you've been believing lies. The Bible says in Luke 17, 21, nor will people say, look, here it is, or see, it is there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you and among you. It's in your hearts and surrounding you. How can you postpone something that's already in people's hearts and surrounding them? You cannot. It's a bogus lie. It is actually the opposite. <laughs> right? So, 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 so can, can you see how twisted all of this is, right? First of all, we, 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 we don't understand what God's definition of Jew is. We don't understand what God's definition of Israel is, right? 
We acknowledge that there is some kind of unknown agenda for the 12 tribes of Israel, because it says so. I don't know what it is. But here we have now political Zionists redefining for us who the Jews are, because they're not saying that the church is the Jews. No, because that's Bible doctrine. They're saying that who they say are Jews are Jews. Judaists are Jews. And other groups, and Ashkenazis, oh, they're Jews. Not according to God. Now, moving on. Dispensationalists invent a theology of postponement of the greater plan for genetic Israel and the actual Jews and conclude God's interlude of uh, the church, right? Because we're the interlude. We're, we're the afterthought. With an event known as a pre-trib rapture, okay? So <clears throat> after a period of time that is relatively powerless because signs and wonders have stopped with the book of Acts and our job is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, warm pews, and uh, get rescued by the pre-trib rapture because Antichrist and Satan are almighty and all-powerful. <laughs> um, this, this is their whole shtick. Now, from beginning to end, their focus is on genetic Jews, or, or they believe that God's focus is on genetic Jews. And in the church, right, because this is a trickle-through, in the church, we're supposed to pray for them. And praying for them with the idea in our mind that God is working on a separate covenant than the one he worked through Yeshua Messiah. And so the advent of Messiah, Jesus, will allow for God to finish the intent he had for genetic Israel, which was always his major plan. Now, <clears throat> I want you to know something, okay? I, I really need you to know this, right? Did you know the Schofield Bible, which was the major evangelistic tool of dispensationalism, was supported by high-level Zionist bankers and socialists, Kabbalists, okay? Including Samuel Gompers, Fiorello LaGuardia, Abraham Strauss, Bernard Baruch, and Jacob Schiff. How did it get such widespread accolades? Answer, because the people with the money made it do that. <laughs> okay, now, I'm going to do a little screen share here, because you need to, you need to see this for yourself, okay? Look, look at this. Who was Cyrus Schofield? I took this from churchclips.com. Um, as a young con artist in Kansas after the Civil War, he met up with John J. Ingalls, an aging Jewish lawyer who had been sent to Atchison by the Secret Six some 30 years before to work the abolitionist cause, pulling strings both in Kansas and with his compatriots back east. Ingalls assisted Schofield in gaining admission to the bar and procured his appointment as federal attorney for Kansas. Ingalls and Schofield became partners in a railroad scam, which led to Cirrus be serving time for criminal forgery. While he was in prison, Schofield began studying the philosophy of John Darby, a pioneer of the Plymouth Brethren movement, and the Any Now Rapture Doctrine. Upon his release from prison, Schofield deserted his first wife, Lynette Carey Schofield, and his two daughters, Abigail and Helen. And he took his mistress, <laughs> as a mistress, a young girl from the St. Louis Flower Mission. He later abandoned her for Helen Van Ward, whom he eventually married. Following his Illuminati connections to New York, he settled in at the Lotus Club, which he listed as his residence for the next 20 years. It was here that he presented his ideas for a new Christian Bible concordance and was taken under the wing of Samuel Untermeyer, who later became chairman of the American Jewish Committee, president of the American League of Jewish Patriots, and chairman of the non-sectarian anti-Nazi League. Untermeyer introduced Schofield to numerous Zionists and socialist leaders, including Samuel Gompers, Fiorello LaGuardia, Abraham Strauss, Bernard Baruch, and Jacob Schiff. These were the people who financed Schofield's research trips to Oxford and arranged the publication and, and distribution of his concordance. Look at this guy, Jacob Schiff, American banker, businessman, philanthropist, among other things. He helped finance the expansion of American railroads and Japanese military efforts against Tsarist Russia 
And if you didn't know, the Rothschilds, which are behind a lot of the Zionist movement, have had a long-standing problem with the Romanovs. And that was actually a lot of what World War I centered around, the issue, the issue with the Romanov family. <clears throat> now, uh, Jacob Schiff, born in Frankfurt, Germany, Schiff migrated to the United States after the American Civil War and joined the firm Kuhn, Loeb & Co. from his base on Wall Street. He was the foremost Jewish leader. <laughs> Jewish leader. <clears throat> from 1880 to 1920, and <clears throat> what later became known as the Schiff era, <laughs> grappling with all major Jewish issues and problems of the day. He was trying to solve Jewish problems, that is, problems for the political Zionist defined Jew population, <laughs> including the plight of the Russian Jews under the Tsar, American and international anti Semitism, blah, blah, blah. Okay. It, it, do you see the problem with getting funding from the Illuminati? Okay. Do, do, you, do you really think that the Illuminati are going to ask me? I dare one of you to ask me, Daniel, how much money has Bride Ministries received from the Illuminati for what you're doing? How many of your books are they helping to support? Ask somebody, please put your hand up. Does anybody want to take a guess? Yeah. None of you, because you're not that stupid. You're not that stupid. They're not giving me any money because I'm their enemy. <laughs> I am not on their side. And I am helping people try to get free to connect with Jesus. But what is C.I. Schofield doing? Their business. Why is it so easy to connect for, like, you know, <laughs> of course Daniel's not getting paid by them. <laughs> but, oh, C.I. Schofield. Oh, no, you know, you just don't understand theology, Daniel. <clears throat> I got something for you. I got something for you. Um, some of you have seen this before. Some of you need to see it again. Yeah, that's you. If you are really struggling and you're doing that, well, but... You've been listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. This podcast is a production of Bride Ministries International. Visit our website at brideministriesinternational.com to enjoy the Bride Ministries Church, the Bride Ministries Institute, free resources, and to support us financially. <laughs>